We're back to spend a few more lucky minutes with Dr. Danielle Ofre. If you haven't listened to the longer podcast, uh, which focuses in part on her latest book, which is titled When We Do Harm, A Doctor Confronts Medical Error, don't miss it. Our conversation about medical malpractice from the doctor's point of view and medical errors and adverse events will enlighten you and engage you. And it just made me stop a hundred times and go, hmm, just so thoughtful, the insight. But now let's learn more about some of the other parts of Dr. Ofri's life. Welcome back, Dr. Ofri. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. It's my pleasure. What I know so far about you personally, because we've just very recently met and, you know, spoken for less than an hour in our lifetimes, is this little blurb I found on your website that says, in lieu of going to the gym, I spend my evenings wrestling with the Bach cello suites, routinely bested by a guy who's been dead for 270 years. You strive for a serene, uncluttered life of Zen, but instead, you've got teenagers. Tell us more about what you do when you're not busy doing the thousand other things that we talked about on the other podcast. So um, I, I took up cello when my uh, oldest teenager was going into kindergarten, when her school was going to have violin lessons. I thought, oh, I'll get a jump start and I'll teach her cello and I'll play, learn cello myself. She ended up quitting, but I, I fell in love with the instrument. So I've been taking lessons uh, ever since. It's been about 14 or 15 years. And I, I find that's the one thing I want to do when I finally, in the evenings, you know, when the dinner's done and the childcare stuff is done, there's that one hour before you collapse into bed exhausted. And I know I could probably work out. I could probably read the New England Journal of Medicine. I could, you know, catch up in the news. But really, the one thing I want to do is, is practice. And I think it's because playing music is the temperamental opposite of life in the hospital. Now, life in the hospital is just this chaotic scene, you know, pagers going off and phones ringing and patients are upset and nurses are knocking the door and administrators are calling you and you've got the EMR. And it's like being in, in this like war zone of minutia. But then when I work on the cello, it's so different because on a stringed instrument, I grew up playing piano where it's really easy to find a note, right? It's just right there. But on a stringed instrument, you have to actually find it. And you find it not with your fingers, but with your ears. So you have to listen, you have to squint your ears to really find that note. And then it just doesn't just have to be right. It also has to be beautiful, which again, we don't give a lot of shrift to beauty in medicine. And so the idea of like listening hard and finding the beauty is just like the opposite of my, my daily life. And I, and I think it also does inform my, my work life as well, because I think that squinting to listen is something that we should be doing with our patients to really listen hard. And you know, we think about medical error and patient frustration so often as patients don't feel like they're heard. And so music is just sort of one parallel to that. So that's what I do for myself. And I've been working on the box suites now for years, and, and uh, it's going to be a lot more years till I get through the end. I just finished the midpoint of the third suite. There are six, and I just in the beginning of the fourth suite. So come back in 20 years, I'll let you know if I got to the other end. And then I've got three kids, and they're teenagers. And, you know, teenagers are what they are. And, and especially in the pandemic, when they're cooped up at home and they're miserable, and they make sure they let you know about that, you know, um, <laughs> You um, you can only do wrong when you have teenagers. Everything you do is wrong. So it's a very sort of humbling experience. That's well. First of all, congratulations on the learning to play the cello in your adult years. I think your love and your passion for that comes across. And I hope when I come back to you in twenty years, you'll be performing for us, which would be fantastic. Uh -huh. And I've often thought um, in the midst of this pandemic, because my kids are my kids are all grown and launched now. But I've often thought that the only thing worse than being quarantined as a social type A extrovert like I am would be being quarantined with teenagers. So my heart goes out to you. Bless it's a you. Very, uh, it's a very moody existence. A lot of teenagers <laughs> in a small spot. I'm sure. I'm sure. So I know that you'll be featured in an upcoming documentary, or maybe it's already out, I'm not sure, called Why Doctors Write. Talk to us about why do you write and how did your journey um, from medicine result in where you are now, this lovely combination of medicine and writing? You know, when I, when I did my residency, it was during the height of the AIDS epidemic, which makes the current COVID-19 pandemic sort of an interesting reflection, sort of bookending my, my training. And then as now, it was very intense and patients were dying and they tended to, at that time, be very young. Our, our age it was very devastating. And I remember thinking, 
this is a singular moment. And I should be writing this stuff down, but but I couldn't. And I think it's because, A, there wasn't any time, right? It was just so busy. But I think also because it was too close to the emotional bone at the time. And so after my training, I decided to take a year and a half off from medicine. And I spent 18 months. I did a little bit of locum tenens, kind of temp work, or to work for four, six, eight weeks in some place that, you know, was short a doctor. And there was nothing to do in these small towns. And so I began writing down some of the stories of residency. And then when I finished my gig, I would travel until the money ran out and I would, you know, write while I traveled. I'd, you know, call the agency, collect from Oaxaca, Mexico and say, what do you got next? And they'd give me another gig and I'd go do that. And that was the time to step away from the intensity of medicine and AIDS and all the devastation and begin to write things down. And it wasn't writing for a book. I just wanted to put it down. And then when I, you know, um, began working as a doctor, in fact, because of the economic freeze of the, you know, the economy at the time, I, I couldn't get a full-time spot. I only had a 60% position. So I had this time off and I picked up a writing brochure off the street on 2nd Avenue and took a writing class and just began taking more, you know, one class after another and working on the stories. And eventually um, I uh, sent them out to literary journals, which is why they have a, you know, a warm spot in my heart. And then one day a publisher called me and asked if I had a, you know, a book. And I said, as a matter of fact, I do. And, and uh, I mailed her the manuscript and we've been together, you know, through all these books now. Um, so that's really how it came to be. It wasn't, wasn't in the plans. You know, my, my PhD is in straight science. I thought I'd be a lab scientist, do a little clinical work on the side. But in fact, you know, I am a strictly clinician with doing writing on the side. Well, I think you've landed in the right place. I can't even imagine you as a lab scientist. You're so um, gifted, I'm sure, in the medicine that you practice and in your writing. So do you see this becoming a bigger part of your life, the writing? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. My, my first agent said, oh, we'll make you enough money so you can quit your day job. I thought, I don't want to quit my day job. It's, it's who I am, you know, and also what would I write about? But it's interesting because, you know, I love doing my PhD. I, I love the laboratory and, and um and I, I love science and I still do. There's a sort of a kid in a candy store feel that science gives you that maybe in medicine is a little more hierarchical than in science, but you, you can't do all of those things. Um, and I discovered when I did my training, how much I love the human side of medicine. Um, so this is sort of the perfect balance for me that I have my clinical work and I have some time for writing and editing the Bellevue literary review and, um, and playing the cello. And I think if I had to do to only be a writer, I think I'd go out of my mind facing a blank screen. And if I only did patient care, you know, I think I'd also be a little overwhelmed. So I'm glad I have my, my fingers in a couple of different pies. Mm, that's good. That's great. What, um, so you've got a lot on your plate. There's no doubt about it. I mean, if we just started with the three teenagers, that's one thing. And then you're a doctor and a professor and a writer. What keeps you going and gets you out of bed every morning? I, mean, I, I have to be honest, I love what I do. I, I'm so happy. Even when I'm frustrated at work, I, I just love it. And part of it is I have phenomenal colleagues. I work in a, in a wonderful city hospital called Bellevue Hospital. It's the oldest public hospital in the United States and uh, doors open to all. And it attracts a certain kind of person and people who I, so I have wonderful colleagues. They're smart, they're interesting, they're incredibly dedicated. And I have amazing patients. I, and you know, you're able to, I mean, one thing in medicine is you get to move the needle for a patient, even by a degree, it doesn't get better than that. Like even just re-timing the Lasix, you know, they take so they can get out of the house, not have to find a bathroom and, and enable them to get out of the house. You've changed someone's life. You don't have to save their life, but you can make it a little bit better. And I think we're so lucky. How fortunate can you be to have a job where you can make someone's life a little bit better? Um, and I look at my friends who are sitting in, you know, conference rooms on endless me you know, meetings about scalability and moving widgets. I think, oh my God, throw me off a cliff. You know, I, I couldn't be, I mean, I'm glad someone's got to do that, but I couldn't. So that keeps me going with great patients. Um, and, and I think in the pandemic, it actually pointed out that while everyone else was stuck at home, we were kind of fortunate. We got to go to work every day and we had purpose. You know, we learned that quarantine boredom happened with us. And even though it was overwhelming, could be devastating, we had a reason to go to work and, and having purpose in life is one of the key ingredients, I think, of life satisfaction. So I think that we're very fortunate to be in this job where we have colleagues that share those values and we have patients who make it all worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds corny, but it's really true. Well, to me, it doesn't sound corny at all. To me, it sounds like I think what all of us who've 
been in healthcare and loved our jobs <clears throat> are going to struggle with when the job isn't there anymore, you know, even for a short time. You know, I'm certainly getting to the point where retirement or slowing down is in the picture. And I'm like, what am I going to do with all this knowledge in my head? And how am I going to feel exactly what you just said there that I've changed someone's life a little bit for the better today? I mean, it's not going to come from shopping or a game of golf or lunch, not knocking retirement, because I'm sure there's parts of it that are going to be some kind of heaven. But um, it's it's challenging to find things that give you that same sense of joy and purpose that being a healthcare provider And I does. think one thing is that it's not a job, it's who we are, right? People don't say, oh, I'm, I'm retired. You're always a nurse. Even, even if you're not working in the hospital, you're still a nurse and you never stop. And I think that society views you that way. But I think it's, it's, it's a personal identity. And um, it, it is who we are in this very fundamental way. And maybe it's different than if you work, you know, in an office, you know, that's your job, but it isn't who you are. But I think in healthcare, um, it identifies us. It is the core of our being and, and different than perhaps in some other profession. I think it's similar to being a teacher. You're always a teacher, right? It's not your job. It is who you are. And I think that's why in healthcare, we feel so so focused and dedicated because it, it is who we are. I agree. That's a really good point. And it's how everyone else sees us too. I mean, I haven't been at the bedside for a few years now, but I'm still the person who gets the phone call, regardless of the situation, from friends and family and neighbors and kids. You know, I'm the nurse, call her. She's, you know, she's the nurse. So that's a good point. So what are the kind of things that keep you up at night? Because you must see a lot of the good and the bad that the world has to offer. You know, I think, thinking back during the pandemic, you know, most nights I slept because we were exhausted. But I remember the night the first day early on when I think maybe a dozen patients got intubated overnight and one fell swoop and we realized there were only 10 ventilators left. And that if another dozen patients needed to be intubated, we could actually fall short. And I don't think I've ever in my life felt that kind of um, fear of not having the tools. I mean, we always, you know, we don't have the things that we need in, in the small sense, but that kind of sense, we might have to ration care in a way we've never had to do, that was the first night I didn't sleep. And so I think the things that keep me up at night, and I sleep pretty well in general, but the idea that we can't do what we need to do. And, and I, you know, we talk about burnout amongst doctors and nurses. I think more about moral injury than burnout. And that yeah, some of us are burned up, but mostly what keeps us up at night is that we, we are uh, hamstrung, that we can't do the care we want to give that the EMR burdens us or, or these, all these administrative uh, mandates and regulations and, 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 and you know, various things we have to do prevent us from giving patient care. And that's the part that hurts that you can't, you have to, you're forced to cut corners sometimes because of insurance requirements or timing requirements or, or budgetary things. And that's the part that, that, um, that keeps me up at night. Hmm. Do you feel we're recording this in the middle of July in 2020, do you feel the crisis and the fear that perhaps you won't have adequate supplies to provide care has passed? Or are we still in a danger zone? Well, I think that when it comes to uh, actual supplies, I think we're now okay because now we, we know what to expect. I think in the beginning, as it was happening, we didn't have a sense of scale. And so we were, as we say, kind of building the airplane while we're flying it. But what I'm worried about is what's going to happen you know, uh, in a few months, you know, in, when schools, if they open, what happens when flu season happens? And not so much about the virus. I worry about our society. In the U.S., as in Brazil, we're so fragmented about how we look at public health. And there are swaths of our society that, that feel like you know, wearing masks is a, a political issue and that, you know, and the disdain for science um, and uh, it, just, it, it baffles the mind. I, I don't understand how, how it could be. And that feels like it's foreboding doom. I mean, the virus is terrible, but, you know, it can be fought. We can do it, but it requires, you know, this enormous effort in a whole society. But if our society is fragmented and if people just disdain science, I mean, I don't know, facts are facts. And, and to see people just sort of blow them away because they don't agree with them or doesn't fit their ideology uh, baffles the mind. And it's really very hard, you know, to battle facts. And I remember an image that really stands out is when, and this is a few months ago in, in the United States. I think it might have been in Michigan where people were uh, protesting at, at the um, state house 
because of the lockdown and the mask wearing. And three nurses just walked out and stood and crossed their arms in their PPE and just stood there, you know, to, with quite a, a strong amount of courage to say, you know, look, we're here. We're putting our lives and our families on the line to treat this illness. And, and look at you protesting the lockdown because it's not convenient or, you know, the economic damage is certainly real. But it, um, I, I so admire those, those three nurses and I'll, and I'll never uh, forget that. And so that's the part that, that, you know, keeps me up at night and worries me. I think you just outlined your next book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. I'd, I'd love to read it. So what is something, very general question, what is something that people get wrong about you? You know, I'm kind of an open book, so I, I don't know if, the, if um, what people get wrong. I mean, people might think I'm bigger or louder than, than I am. Um, or, uh, and, you know, um, people often say, boy, you're really brave for being honest. And I don't feel particularly brave. You know, I feel like being honest about, you know, my own errors and shortcomings, that's the easy part. Man, owning up, that's not hard. You know, figuring out how to fix it, that's a lot harder. But people keep saying it's very courageous to talk about, you know, the dirty laundry, to talk about where we go wrong. And, and I feel like that's the easy part and that I don't get, shouldn't get any great, you know, kudos. It's not a purple heart for doing that. The purple heart is when you really, you know, do the energy to fix the things. And, and that's, that's still a long ways in coming. Mm, yeah, excellent point. Excellent point. I talked to a lot of nurses about, about legal issues in healthcare and, um, that's, uh, you know, I sometimes get that comment, too, that I'm so comfortable talking about the errors and the mistakes. But, you know, and I think you're alluded to this in your book that our bad day when things went really wrong is someone else's really bad day. I mean, the fact that we had three codes or whatever happened that day, that's nothing compared to what happened, you know, to the patient and their families, you know, in the in the aftermath of that. So as a general piece of advice, and this is my final question. But it's a biggie. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you offer your younger self? I would want myself to be a little more empathetic to myself. And I think that I don't, the errors that I made as an intern and a resident so overwhelmed me. Um, I mean, the shame was, was so powerful and I didn't say anything. I didn't tell anyone. And I realized that I put my patient at greater risk because I wasn't able to come forward and talk about them. And so I have some empathy of why I did that, but I wish I had more courage then. And I would advise myself to, you know, push yourself over that hump to be honest about your shortcomings. Um, and, and I guess the second part of that advice is to really seek the human connection and, and I think what brought me to science initially was the love of science. And that's where the PhD comes in. But what I think really ultimately brought me to medicine, which took me a while to appreciate, was the beauty of the human connection. And, and that is, is what it is. And being a physician and being a nurse in some ways has more in common with being a social worker than with being a scientist. We call ourselves scientists. We wear white coats and, 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 and cite science, which, of course, is very important. I will never uh, negate that. But the heart of what we do is this human interaction. And I didn't realize that when I picked medicine. But now that I do, I would have told myself that earlier. And when I encourage people to go into the field, and I absolutely do encourage people to enter healthcare, it's because of the human side. And the science side, it's a great sort of uh, second portion. And I'm glad we have both. And, and how perfect you know, can it be to have both those things? But the real reason to be there is that you get to be with people. And how great is that? It's great. It's really great. Are you, like you're a professor now, is there a way to impart that wisdom to the students that you're teaching? I think it is in, in focusing on, on the people. And so when we want to talk about a topic, I don't know, reflux disease or pancreatitis, we can talk about the pathophysiology, but you know what? They'll forget it and they can look it up again. And I don't even remember it either, but you can talk about the first time you gave a patient a diagnosis of a severe illness you know, of end-stage pancreatitis or a cancer diagnosis, or the first time you talk to a patient about an error that you made, or the first time you made an error, um, those are things that the students will remember. Or let's go to the bedside, you know, when there's a difficult, a quote-unquote difficult patient, or the patient 
you know, refusing treatment or the patient wants to sign out against medical advice or the patient who's demanding pain meds, rather than jump into, let's call HP to take care of it, let's go talk to the patient. Almost always, you can form a human connection to scale back the tension. You may not solve the problem or, you know, undo decades of addiction or distrust and fear, but you can almost always improve the channels of communication. You can imbue some respect and some caring, and that will get you quite a ways. And, but you can only do that in real time. You can't give a PowerPoint on that. You can't, you know, give us, you know, a clinical prediction rule of how to connect with a patient. You have to do that. You know, if a patient's yelling in the waiting room, rather than call security, I want to go out there and bring the students with me. Let's see how we can help this patient who's clearly something's happened. Let's see if we can help things. So that would be my advice for students to really try and get in there and, and, and see if you can make a human connection. And the other things, they'll fall into line after that. Mm, that's some really great advice. And I think also when you care about someone and you've connected with them, you'll have protection. You'll feel the need to protect them. You won't stand by and watch something happen. You will protect them and do your best job. So I think with that, we'll call this done. I just want to again say thank you so much, Dr. Ofri, for your very generous sharing of your time and your wisdom and now a little bit about your personal self. I very much appreciated that. It's been a pleasure. If you'd like to know more about Dr. Ofri, like we said in the earlier recording, she's at danielofri.com. She's got a, a new book that's available that you could click and buy very quickly. It's called When We Do Harm, A Doctor Confronts Medical Error. And I can tell you once again, she's lovely to work with and to talk to. And um, I have enjoyed every single minute of listening to you talk. So thank you, Dr. Ofri. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. <laughs>